uh, we've asked uh, Keisha Mallet, our program manager for our diocesan disaster response to join us for this conversation. Uh, as a reminder, the Mission AMP team has come up with reflection questions for congregations as you consider next steps. Uh, those and other notes and links for this conversation are available at epicenter.org slash virtual dash church, epicenter.org slash virtual church. So go take a look at that when you have a moment, but let's start today with prayer and Stephanie is going to be leading us. Thank you, Jason. Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that as we believe your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to have ascended into heaven, so we may also in heart and mind there ascend and with him continually dwell, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Then a scripture reading. A reading from Ephesians. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sorry, I muted myself there for a moment because uh, as we all have occurrences, someone was running the printer right next to me. So sorry about that. Um, uh, before we get into our conversation with Keisha, I just wanted to offer up one celebration of something that's going on across the diocese. As some of you may know, uh, we or the bishop uh, planted a new church in the North Shore neighborhood uh, that has begun to do outreach out in that community led by uh, Maria Bautista. And this week they're actually launching their food distribution for neighbors in need right now. And it has been so cool to see a community that hasn't even begun to have public worship yet to go ahead and begin responding to the needs in their neighborhood. So, I want to lift it, lift up that celebration, but um, continuing on with what we're here for today, Keisha, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're so glad to have this conversation with you. Would you just take a moment and uh, let folks know a little bit about what your role is in the diocese and, and what you do? Yes, I'm part of the Hurricane Disaster Recovery Team. And we started with um, Hurricane Harvey, and that has been our focus since Hurricane Harvey came through um, in 2017. And it might surprise many to know that there are still so many communities across Texas and especially in our diocese who have yet to recover from Hurricane Harvey. And those that are um, have the most difficulty recovering certainly are those that we would consider most vulnerable in our neighborhoods and in our communities. And so with this pandemic, it just um, shows even more the fissures in our society and in our communities with our vulnerable neighbors who, you know, have yet to get over the last disaster that befell them and now they're having mm -hmm. to deal with um, unemployment and the realities of, of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, we're all grateful for the work that you all do and your leadership in the diocese. If, if you're watching this and you're at diocesan council uh, in February, you remember the amazing video that was shown of the work that this team has led um, for the diocese and with uh, congregations. Uh, it was so beautiful and I'm grateful that you guys are again on the uh, front lines with, with this work. I want to invite anybody that's watching, please leave your comments and questions on Facebook Live uh, on the diocesan uh, Facebook page. We'd love to, to hear what you're thinking and um, any questions you have. And um, Stephanie's going to kick us off with our first question for you. I, well, I've worked with Keisha personally and um, with, um, since I do work with the youth of the diocese, we've worked with you guys to help um, help the, the congregations and areas that are 
still a need and it, it has always surprised the youth when we are working that there are still communities that are still affected and still haven't been um, haven't been have aren't fully recovered from Hurricane Harvey and now as you mentioned are getting hit again with this pandemic um, but we do have congregations that want to help and which is wonderful just like um, North Shore that Jason just lifted up so how should congregations begin to think about what they have to offer and how to maybe match that with the needs that are around us thank you Stephanie um, I should go back and say that uh, the team that is working disaster recovery is just um, two and a half people. <laughs> so the real work is getting done through the congregations. It's not us who's out there um, feeding people and rebuilding and providing, you know, mental health um, services to those that were impacted by Hurricane Harvey. It is our congregations who found uh, their niche and their need in the community. And it's, it's like um, puzzle pieces coming together. It's the gifts that, the, that your congregation has that can fill a void and help to partner in a community um, so that both of you can be stronger together. And I'm sure that many of those who are watching have learned of traditional ways of assessing gifts. Um, during stewardship time, we look at what are your time, talents, and treasures, right? Uh, but there are ways that you can deepen that conversation and really get people's juices flowing. There's um, models that look at the five P's, um, which is people, uh, place, or your property. Your, your posture in the community is your congregation turned you know, inward or outward focusing. Um, is it domestic mission oriented, internationally mission oriented? Um, the purse. And then the program, you know, what type of programs do you already have ongoing or ministries in your church? So that's another lens through which to look at gifts. Um, you can also stimulate conversation with your folks by talking about um, what do you all care about in the community? What are the concerns? that folks would actually act on, something that's not just a niglet, but something that would motivate them to take action. What dreams do people in your community have for the community around them and their neighbors, you know, and, and go through that kind of a thought exercise. <clears throat> and another way to look at gifts is, what are the gifts of the head? What are the gifts of the heart? And what are the gifts of your hands? And in this day and age, especially with COVID-19, the church is becoming a place and one of the few places where we can be a trusted source of information. So you may not realize just how much information um, that you have that might be beneficial to those that are your neighbors in your community. And so those are various ways that you can look at what are the gifts that we can bring um, that we have that we're willing to act on in the community. After a, a con after oh, a congregation, ahead, sorry, after a congregation has gotten some clarity on what gifts they have to bring, what, how they can engage a community, how would you recommend a congregation to discern, determine what organizations in their context to partner with? That's something that you guys have demonstrated really well. You've been kind of a matchmaker in many contexts, but I'm so I'm curious, what is, what's, your, what's your advice to congregations when they're thinking about who should we partner with? So one thing is finding out who is in the community already doing work, because that um, the one thing about all this work that we do is it's built on relationships. And sometimes a disaster kickstarts groups together into a relationship. But most of the time, they're built over the course of time. So if you can um, look in the community and find out who is already active, sometimes you can uh, even just Google community organizations active in, you know, and fill in your city and find out the list of those. Um, mine the information and the connections that your members have already. So let's say there is a, um, a community group that's meeting on your campus 
or you have members who are part of this guild or that association, you know, are there any synergies between your gifts and um, the organizations that you already have entree into? Uh, finding out who is working in your neighborhoods and in your communities, you can then observe them, uh, sign up for their newsletters, at their emails, um, attend their Zoom meetings uh, these days, and see what they're doing. Find out what service projects they have going on. If you're able to safely observe and participate in one of their service projects or get to know about that, find out if they're truly active or if they're just kind of a name placeholder in the community. And then you'll be able to start that discerning process of are they a good fit for you and for uh, what you, the direction that you're going in, in, a, in um, in the community and how you're thinking you want to serve. Those are really, really good points. And I've seen some congregations, we had Grace Alvin on a few, was it just last week? They're all, it's all running together. Um, and they have partnered with a, a, a local organization to help with their their um, their mobile food pantry. And so, yeah, when, it, when you see, when you, you will find those matches. The one thing to keep in mind is that this is a very iterative process. So you're going to take a step, look, kind of see how it's going, you know, reassess, take another step. And that sorts of guides you through where you find that synergy. Yeah, that's really, really wise. Um, we got a question from the chat and um, which is what were you, what and wants to know what kind of help do people still need regarding Harvey? Um, do you have some answers for that, Keisha? Sure. Uh, there's um, we all know that the feeding uh, uh, insecurity has just been exacerbated by COVID nineteen. Um, so there are still those needs, but it's home repairs. Uh, it takes a lot of money and a lot of time, and Prior to COVID, we had volunteers who were available to come and do the work if we could sponsor the materials. Now under COVID, we are unable to do that. Communities are unable to um, volunteer uh, safely for rebuilding. That leaves those who are doing rebuilding projects having to go to skilled labor. And that requires a lot of funds uh, to do that. So we're still trying to get people back in their homes. Once their home is safe, sanitary, and functional, which is kind of the criteria that we look at for getting them back home, um, then often they've lost all their furniture and their appliances. And so it's you know fulfilling those needs as well. I think that's surprising to a lot of folks to know that that's still going on. And we know because we sh we're in the office with you all that this is something that's been an ongoing thing. But I think it's shocking for a lot of folks to know that our Hurricane Harvey still hasn't been fully recovered from. I think one of the hard things is that at this stage, two and a half years, uh, going on three years now, is that um, most uh, charitable organizations are shutting down their programs. The FEMA sponsored disaster case management program is closing down in a couple of months. And so everything is starting to wind down. And it is those people who have least been able to recover who are still hanging out there. They're just falling through the cracks of the system. And the money is drying up. The help is now, you know, very, very scarce. Um, it, it's extremely difficult for these families. I, yeah, I can't imagine just the compounded damage um, on the on folks. That's crazy. It's making it worse that you can't have those volunteers in because it is a safety issue. Um, because we want to keep both our volunteers and our the homeowners who are more vulnerable safe. So. What should we be know? What should we know about those that we are trying to serve? Should we, I, like you mentioned, that they they are, it's exposing the things that were already there um, of food and insecurity and others. But can you tell us some about those people we want to try to serve and reach? 
Sure, I think there are some, some overarching things to keep in mind um, when you go out into the community. Um, one is that having that posture of, of humility, um, that the ultimate goal would be that there would be mutual transformation on both sides of the equation. We always seek to do things with our communities and not to them, right? So we're not trying to go in and do, do things to them and for them. We're really trying to partner with our those that we seek to serve as well and recognizing that they have gifts to contribute. They might not always be apparent to us and even those that we seek to serve may not realize the gifts that they have. But there are some very resilient people in these communities who have figured out how to survive, how to navigate these systems, and they have very strong gifts to contribute. Some of our best Hurricane Harvey um, programs have incorporated those that we were um, assisting with built, rebuilding their homes and have provided resources so that their gifts could surface as well. And that provides real transformation on both sides of the equation for, for us. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that if we have thought of a solution, chances are they have as well. So we might think from our, you know, place of institution and behind our steeples that, um, oh, if only they had this, or if only um, we would just give them whatever, you know, that would solve it. Um, it's a good chance somebody's gone down that road, whether it's the community themselves or other partners in the community. So again, having that, uh, that position of being a, uh, a learner, um, wanting to be open to the conversation, and open to being transformed yourself by, by learning what they truly need and asking those questions. What is it that you need? Um, th those are, are some real open-ended conversations that you can have that demonstrate that you can be a trusted partner with folks. Do you have I love on oh, how to not right. reinvent the wheel, like you're saying, like how you might <laughs> encourage congregations exactly. to do not do the same thing that other people might have already tried. Yeah. And so that's why it's um, it's kind of a triad, right? It's it's your group, it's the groups that are already in play in the community, and it's the community members that you seek to serve as well. And 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 finding that that flow of what's been going on and getting in that stream and finding where your niche is. And that's why we think that iterative and evaluation along the way that assessment, if you will, of what's working, what's not working, where can we fit in, where can we try this? Um, it's a process and you need to be committed to the community and committed to, um, to going down that road and learning and evolving. Is that something that you all um, provide direction or training for in your work? Or if folks are interested in that and they think, we wanna to respond to the need in our community, this is really good, practical, succinct information that you're sharing with us. And is there a place that you would direct people to think more about, you know, is there an assessment tool or things that you would recommend for people to, to go down this path? Um, we work in the context of disaster recovery. And however, we were schooled in a discipline called asset-based community development. Um, Episcopal relief and development is is very big in that, and uh, if you you know picked up a book, um, toxic charity or when helping hurts, or look into a, um, a seminar on asset based community development, you'll see this mindset of the transformation that can occur on both sides of the equation, the symbiosis between the giver and the receiver. And, and how to start to weave those things together. Um, we also do have in our arsenal a couple of, uh, of tools we'd be happy to share uh, with you all for conversation starters and such that have been shared with us um, that might help stimulate conversation in communities and help them. And these are the things that as we have found congregations 
um, who wanted to participate in hurricane recovery but didn't exactly know what the niche would be, we would have these dialogues with them so that they could kind of discover um, what was a good fit between them and the community. I love it. That's great. It's, it seems important to point out as, as you're demonstrating here, and there's not a silver bullet to fixing a problem. It requires the, the time and commitment to relationships and ongoing conversation with the different people involved in, in this type of work. I would put one plug in there. Um, start now. Definitely mm. think that this is too big to, to, to undertake. Um, because you can over-engineer it, you can overthink it, but just start somewhere. If there might be you and another person who, you know, has a thought, explore that, try it, iterate, realize that you might, you know, have bumps in the road and, uh, and have to ditch the first plan and go with the second, but that's okay. Uh, there's, um, there's a, 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 a saying that we keep at the forefront of our mind Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. And starting these relationships now and getting to know the people that you seek to serve and those that are in your community will also help when the next critical situation occurs, whether it's a man-made or a natural disaster, where you need to partner up with your communities. Start building those relationships now. I love it. Well, thank you, Keisha, for joining us and having the, oh, Stephanie, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, as our congregations are thinking about regathering and what that looks like, like creating those partnerships could be really valuable right now as, um, as they're thinking of what, what they're going to restart, what they're, what they're going to keep on hold. And, um, and there's still time to, to make those relationships and, and consider what those partnerships want to look like as we, as the future does not look like the past did, um, as we are not going back to February mm. anytime soon. So I think these are this is a really important uh, thing to consider as as our churches are are thinking about how to how they be that they are being the church in the world, and not just um, worshiping. So so yeah, this is so important. Wait. Thanks, Keisha. I think we've realized that we're Absolutely. not islands unto ourselves or as institutions, and so. Uh, we need to figure out what each other's gifts are and to leverage those as best we can. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and we'll, we're going to continue this conversation as well next week. Uh, we're going to continue to talk about what it looks like to equip members and to connect with our neighbors. Um, again, thank you so much, Keisha, for having this conversation with us this week. We're so grateful for you and your team and what you all do. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. Me. <laughs> Absolutely. We're so glad to, that you'll join us. So our final reminders that we have each time, um, make sure that you follow the CDC guidelines, follow your bishop's direction, and, and when in doubt, do no harm when attempting to do good. And as Jason mentioned at the beginning, notes, links, and further reflection questions from this conversation and all the previous ones are at epicenter.org slash virtual dash church and um, like and comment and share this conversation with your church community and your, and your friends. So we'll see you all next week. Bye friends. Bye friends. Bye.